This is Epicenter, episode 396 with guest Alex Glukowski. Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the podcast where we interview crypto founders, builders, and thought leaders. I'm Sebastian Couture, and I'm here with Frederike Ernst. Today, we're speaking with Alex Klukowski. He's the co-founder of Matter Labs and the co-creator of ZK Sync, and it is the first EVM-compatible ZK rollup. So before we speak with Alex about ZK Sync and get into all the technical nitty-gritties about how that works, uh, we'd like to tell you about our sponsors for this week. Solana is a next-generation blockchain with lightning-fast blocks and fees less than one cent per transaction. Scalability is probably the biggest challenge preventing crypto from becoming the backbone of the world's financial system. And Solana is one of the solutions we have today. Go to solana.com slash epicenter to learn more. We're also sponsored by Exodus. It's an easy to use wallet that supports hundreds of assets and uh, has native apps for all platforms, including iOS and Android. And it's fully non-custodial. The team are firm believers in the not your keys, not your coins mantra. Go to exodus.com and give it a try. And finally, Paraswap, they just came out with a huge update that's even faster and more liquid. It's cheaper than Uniswap, and it comes with a new gas token that can cut your gas fees by up to 50%. It's also multi-chain now, and they've expanded to Polygon and Binance Smart Chain. Start trading at paraswap.io slash epicenter. Alex, hi, thanks for joining us today. Hello, very excited to be here. Thank you, guys. Uh, So tell us a bit about your background and um, how you became involved in the crypto space. Uh, well, I studied computer science in Berlin and I worked as a, uh, a team lead and a software engineer and a CTO in, in, in multiple companies, starting with telecommunication space. And then moved to two startups, um, was co-founder of two startups in Berlin. Uh, and at some point I just felt that um, crypto is uh, going vertical and, and it's just like I can't wait anymore. I have to jump there because my heart is with, in, in crypto. So I was very excited about Bitcoin. Actually, I think I, I learned about Bitcoin one year after it was invented. And back then, uh, it really appealed to me as a kind of libertarian uh, person. Uh, and and it, it was a very exciting technological thing also from, from like the beauty of uh, the architecture of it. Uh, but back then I thought, well, if we could only bind it to gold somehow, maybe it would work. Um, but eventually it uh, actually worked. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I switched only once Ethereum appeared. Uh, I actually, I, I tried to, to, to build a startup in the Bitcoin space, uh, but um, I felt it was too early. We, what we, was we the startup? Uh, we were trying to do uh, something reputation-based, like a uh, sovereign reputation thing. I was doing it with uh, Arthur Bendikin, who is now uh, CTO at, uh, at uh, Aurora. Uh, but yeah, we, we, we couldn't find investors and we thought like it's maybe a bit too early. So I went back to the classical startups. And the startups you, you worked on before crypto, they're actually pretty interesting as well. So maybe let's give, give those like a minute of airtime. So the ones that I found, um, one of them was um, acquired by Urban Sports Club and the other one was a camper rental startup. Tell, tell us what, what drew you to these, uh, these subjects because they're quite, um, they're quite different from one another, no? Uh, This is true. So, well, uh, as a software engineer, I must be honest that initially I was looking into the technical issues and I was not caring so much about the business nature. So it it looked like a very interesting idea. So the first startup was called So Much More. And the idea was that you can get a pass to, uh, it it was essentially a copy of uh, ClassPass, uh, an American startup, where you could purchase a monthly pass to all sports and, and uh, holistic activities in your city, which I found very appealing because like the, this idea of flat rate, uh, it feels like, like communism at some, uh, in some sort, you know, like, like Spotify and Netflix, you just like pay a very small amount per month and you get unlimited access to everything, like full abundance. The future is here, you know, like you, you. Uh, so it, it felt the same way, but uh, it was not very technological. So then with Paul Camper, the, the camper sharing platform, that was very appealing to me because we could build something really interesting with, with com- sophisticated search engine and optimization for the scampers and the booking system. And there was a lot of accounting involved. 
Uh, Paul Kemper was the, the company I, I'm, I'm really, really proud of uh, the team we could build. It was remote first, the IT team. The, the, the business team was based in Berlin, but the IT team was completely remote from day one. And uh, it's, uh, it's highly successful. It's the largest camper sharing platform in uh, Europe right now. Uh, uh, Paul Kemper is present in Germany, UK, um, Switzerland, Austria. I, I think even more countries by now. But I decided to leave it after only one and a half years because I felt like I maxed out. Like I, I, I have done as a CTO, I've done everything I could do there. And the rest does not depend on me. Like the processes and the tech team was were working fine, and there were no not not so many challenges to solve. Uh, whereas in the crypto world, like Ethereum started to to get traction. And actually, when I was in so much more and Paul Kemper, I tried to integrate Bitcoin. I had this idea of like making Bitcoin payments to uh, to be accepted, and then I realized I can't justify that. It just didn't make sense because no, there were no no people using Bitcoin. And it could be a nice PR move, but probably not for these niche startups we had, uh, more consumer-oriented in Europe. Um, and I realized if I think this way, and I'm kind of very pro-Bitcoin, uh, very excited about this technology, this is how everyone is going to think about it for now. So it, it's, it just doesn't make sense. But with Ethereum, it was entirely different. All of a sudden, this idea of smart contracts and open financial system and an alternative financial system would stable coins with uh, all sorts of uh, interesting things with, with, with potential for improved usability was there. Uh, and I figured like I, I can just, my opportunity cost of not going into this is enormous. So I have to switch now. So what I did I, is uh, I went to Hong Kong and uh, I was working as a consultant um, in a research, in an R&D startup. Uh, and we were just going to all the different conferences and meeting people and talking and making research and, and trying to figure out what, what, what are the problems uh, the crypto space is facing, Ethereum space specifically. And uh, I came to the conclusion that there are a couple of things that once solved will bring Ethereum to, to masses and everyone is just going to jump on it. And the problems that had to be solved were the user experience in combination with security. It, it's kind of like a, two sides of the same coin. Uh, and scalability. And while the security in UX were kind of clear how to fix, like we, we, we could just apply principles from the Web2 world, or, or everything we knew, we knew from traditional startups, from mobile apps, um, it was clear what to do and they were actually built. We got MetaMask, we got Argent, we got Dharma, we got all these wallets with social recovery, with uh, the ease of not uh, having to, to, to care about your secret phrases like Zengo and, and wallets based on um, uh, you know, some combination of uh, secret sharing and using your email uh, as login and so on. Um, and all, all the other things were also being built from traditional finance, which we now know as DeFi. But scalability really caught my eye because it was very technological. Like it, it felt like a fundamental problem which cannot be easily solved and, and unless we have some breakthrough. Uh, there were a couple of attempts. Uh, there was this idea of Plasma that was introduced around that time. And I, I remember I, I met uh, Vitalik for the first time in Shanghai uh, at, at a conference where he first spoke about Plasma. Uh, I was very excited, but after half a year or a year or so, it was clear that Plasma is facing a lot of hidden problems and that they appear to be of kind of fundamental nature. Like we, we, we just, we just can't, can't solve them in, in, you know, like just tinkering around. So we need something, something more, more solid. And then I learned about zero knowledge proofs. First about the zero knowledge aspect of zero knowledge proofs so that you can use them for privacy. And later, um, I learned about the succinctness property that some of them have, uh, specifically snarks that you can prove integrity of very large computations and they are much cheaper to verify than actually doing all these computations naively. And my third, first thought was when, when I heard about that, oh, you can apply that to Plasma and make Plasma a lot, uh, like solve a lot of problems in Plasma for that. And if you do that, that that's actually like half a roll up. So like applying zero knowledge proofs to Plasma gives you Validium. And then um, if you put the data on chain, this is the ZK roll up. Uh, and I met Barry Whitehat who was working, who, who built, built the first working group working on ZK rollups. 
and we, we, we met some other guys, we, we had discussions, then we published the, this famous blog post uh, on ETH research about ZK Rollups. And then I met my co-founder, uh, Alex Vlasov, in, uh, at DEF CON in Prague. I think it was DEF CON 4 or 3. He was coming to the same idea from a different angle. He was actually working on Plasma. He, he, he was building a Plasma implementation. And he learned about zero knowledge proofs and, and he was very deep into cryptography, uh, having a PhD in, in high energy physics from uh, McGill University in Canada. Uh, he was really good. I immediately realized that this guy is, is genius and, and we should do something together. And we, we immediately jumped into discussion of how things should be built technologically. We built the first prototype, presented it, and this is how uh, ZK Sync was born. Let's get to our sponsor, Solana. Now, this is a special ad for me to read because I've been a deep supporter of this project since meeting the Solana team back in 2018. I invest personally in the project and my company, Course One, is super deeply involved in the Solana ecosystem, including running the biggest validator. So what's so cool about Solana? Well, we all know that scalability is the single most important issue facing the blockchain industry today. And the Solana blockchain is an amazing solution for it. The network supports thousands of transactions per second with 400 millisecond block times and over 500 validators. The special thing about Solana is also that it's not a sharded blockchain. It's a single blockchain hyper-optimized for performance. So that makes it really easy to maintain composability between all of the apps on Solana so that they work together seamlessly now and forever. The Solano ecosystem is growing at a rapid pace and it's a great place to build your project or just get involved with the community. So go to solana.com slash epicenter to learn more. We've done a, you know, a number of episodes uh, on, on the topic of scalability and, and a few episodes where we've talked specifically about ZK rollups, but um, let's maybe uh, get a little refresh. You know, how, how does a ZK rollup work in a nutshell? Uh, what are the main components and like, what does it try to achieve? So ZK Rollup is a scaling solution uh, that works on top of layer one. So it's a layer two scaling solution, which, which is supposed to derive its security from, uh, from layer one. And it works the following way. Maybe we, we should recap first how Plasma works, because it, it's going to be easier to explain. So with, with, with Plasma, imagine that you have a single contract on layer one that uh, instead of holding all the balances of the users, uh, only holds all the funds together in a single pot, and it holds a root hash of a of a state which is held off chain, which contains all the balances. So we only keep one hash. So this this hash, being a Merkle root, uh, serves as a cryptographic fingerprint of our state. Whenever we change something in the state, the change the the, the root hash will change completely. Now. When we, 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 and we want these users to transact. We want these users to send funds to each other, which will modify the state. So whenever we have multiple transactions, uh, maybe a block of like, let's say 1000 transactions, uh, we would modify the state, applying each of them sequentially to the, to the state, which will modify all the balances. And then we will compute the new root hash of the state and we'll send this new root hash to the smart contract on uh, layer one and replace it. And th this way, we actually, we made only one small transaction on layer one, but we enacted uh, many transfers, thousands of transfers, or thousands of transactions which, which happen on, uh, in layer two. So the, in Plasma, you would suppose to monitor what's going on in the state and try to catch the, so like anyone would be able to, to, to submit the new root hash, and if something goes wrong and the, this new root hash contains invalid transactions or some invalid state, you would have to somehow prevent this new root hash from being finalized on layer one. Uh, and this is difficult. So with, with Plasma and, and ZK rollups rely on so-called fraud proofs where someone has to monitor it and then provide a proof that the new, new state is not uh, valid. With ZK rollups, uh, we do something very elegant. We provide a zero knowledge proof uh, or like 16 zero knowledge proof or snark of validity of all the transactions that happened that produced this new root hash. And the snark is verified by the smart contract itself. So what it means is it, it's been verified on all the full nodes of Ethereum. And only if the snark is valid, uh, 
then we change the, the new root hash on the smart contract. And this way we can guarantee that no invalid transaction is ever included in, um, in, in our uh, rollup block. So just to recap, the, the, there's a so phrase this differently. In an, in, a, in an optimistic rollup, you have a verification of the different hashes in the Merkle tree and the root hash that has to be uh, verified by some, like some third-party process. And one of the ways that we've come to do that is to uh, have this fraud-proof system, but that introduces a whole bunch of complexities. Uh, whereas with a ZK rollup, you simply have uh, a snark that that proves that all of the state in the um, all the transactions uh, in the state that's sent to the to the smart contract uh, is indeed valid. This is correct. Yes. So th this way we can only prove the validity. However, we also have a problem of data availability. So we, we need to make sure that everyone knows what the new root state is, what the new state is completely, not only the root hash. Um, and with rollups, what we do is we publish some data on chain that makes everyone um, able to reconstruct the changes in the state to get the final state somehow. Like if you have the previous state before the block, you should be able to get the new state completely in your local database after the block. So you, you can do it in, in, in multiple ways. You can, can either publish the inputs of all the transactions. This is, you, you can do it with ZK rollup and you can do it with optimistic rollup or you can publish just the final state, like actually like the, the state delta, what, what changed in the state, the final state of every account which was touched in this block. And this is only possible with ZK rollup. And this is very interesting because it, it introduces additional succinctness. So if you have, uh, let's say one account or like two accounts making many transactions between each other, uh, at the end, we will only need to publish two, two updates of the state, like the final balance of the first account and the final balance of the second account, and not all the hundreds of transactions with that, that took place in this block. This places a flaw at how much a transaction can be reduced by, right? So basically, Correct. if you if you have an operator and use a, say, optimistic rollup, um, you, you can uh, compress the data much more. Is that correct? Because you don't need to submit it on chain such that someone can reconstruct the entire thing. Uh, so yeah, th there are multiple factors that that make ZK rollups cheaper in terms of on chain data. Uh, but fundamentally, maybe we should first answer the question: Why does this work as a scaling solution at all? If we still put this data on through on Ethereum network, right? So the the difference from just using the putting this data in uh, you know like using Ethereum on layer one normally is that we don't use storage, we only use the bandwidth of the network, but we do not require the Ethereum full nodes to store it in the Ethereum active state, and we do not require them to verify uh, and like access storage of different contracts to verify transactions, and that part. A random access to the storage is actually the bottleneck right now on Ethereum. This is this is the most expensive thing because you cannot like we use SSDs and we cannot read the data sequentially from SSDs, which would be really fast. Instead, we have to go to like jump to random locations in this memory, and this introduces the delays. And you 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 have to do it sequentially. You have to read one thing, then you have to read the other thing, and, and then because you're working on a global state, right? So that's why that's why you have to do it sequentially. Because you, you're working on the global state, and you work with Merkle proof, uh, uh, Merkle proofs. So you, you you have to retrieve Merkle path for all the accounts, and when you modify them, you have to actually go and like modify all the intermediate nodes on the Merkle tree, um, and this is where you get these delays because these latencies just add up. So what we do with uh, zk rollup we only publish the block as a one big chunk of data. We do not use storage. It doesn't need to touch storage. Uh, it just goes through the network interface. And the bandwidth is a lot cheaper than storage uh, and a lot faster than storage access. So this gives us roughly 100x improvement with ZK rollup. Uh, with optimistic rollup, you can get the kind of the same scalability factor if you optimize the optimistic rollup uh, 
really strongly. For, like, if, 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 what you would need to do is you would have to aggregate the signatures because you still have to publish the signatures on, uh, through, through this network in the rollup, which you don't have to do in a ZK rollup because the signatures are verified by the SNARK. And also you would have, uh, there are some other nuances in optimistic rollups. So the most compressed version would only work with multi-round fraud proofs, something like Arbitrum. And uh, it would be much harder to build uh, with a single round fraud proofs, uh, which Optimism is, uses, is using. But in any case, you still have, like you, you only get a linear scalability boost. Let's get to our sponsor, Exodus. Exodus is a fantastic cryptocurrency wallet that strikes the right balance between ease of use, security, and great features. You can get Exodus on the iPhone, desktop app, web app, Android, whatever platform you use. It's a non-custodial wallet, and that is so critical. Because what's the point of crypto if you don't control your own assets? With Exodus, you always do. They're old school and they've been around since 2015. Over 1.2 million users rely on Exodus, so you know that they've stood the test of time. They have support for over 100 different crypto assets. And from within Exodus, you can easily change one different asset to the other. They also allow you to buy crypto with fiat. And they even have a great offer where you can buy up to $500 worth of crypto through their iOS app and pay just $1 in fee. So go to exodus.com slash epicenter and check out their wallet. We want to thank Exodus for their amazing support of Epicenter. So let's talk about the aggregated block of transaction data. So who who actually aggregates that? And who, basically, if I want a transaction inclu included in a ZK Sync block, how do I go about that? Uh, so you normally have someone called sequencer collecting the transactions from the users and packing them in a block and computing the new root hash of this block. The sequencer can be centralized, it can be a single party with a server which accepts the transactions through REST API. It can also be decentralized, some consensus algorithm, multiple validators collecting the transactions through a peer-to-peer -peer network and they're just agreeing on what the, the new block is going to be and then selecting the leader who will submit it to Ethereum or maybe anyone from, from these validators can submit it to Ethereum. With all the rollups right now, uh, as far as, as I'm aware, everyone is currently using centralized sequencers uh, because with rollups, you do not rely for the sequencer, on the sequencer for security. But they could censor me, right? They could censor you, but only in L2. They cannot censor you in L1. So if, if you feel censored, you can always go to layer one and retrieve your funds through some uh, additional mechanisms. In our case, it's called priority queue. And uh, um, we have something called exodus mode or emergency exit mode, where you can exit without asking anyone for permission. And this is a very important aspect of, of the protocol. But if you, if you are being censored by operators, by the operator, by, by the sequencer in L2, yeah, it, it's, you're just not going to use this service. It, it's not as bad. What are the trade-offs of, of having a, a centralized service and perhaps a decentralized service to ensure like censorship-resistant aspect? It, it just allowed us to, to, to launch the, the ZK Sync earlier. And uh, uh, we, 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 with ZK Sync, we follow the philosophy of progressive decentralization. We start with the minimum viable product, which is decentralized, which does not rely on us or anyone for security. So we, we, we derive security directly from Ethereum. Um, and uh, it's just much faster to build than to have a full fledged, fledged consensus, which we, we are building. And this is very important to ZK Sync. We don't want ZK Sync to rely on any single party long term or even mid term. We want it to be a decentralized protocol governed by the community and having multiple validators that are selected by the community so that we also don't have uh, any censorship um, potential in L2. Uh, long term, actually, we have some more ideas on how to solve censorship, uh, and we, we will rely on even more advanced cryptography. Uh, because even if you have, e even in Ethereum with multiple miners, uh, there is still a chance that they, they will collude. Like, it's not impossible that the miners or validators will collude and will, will prevent users from submitting transactions. And this is actually a one big attack vector on optimistic rollups. 
or on, on other protocols that rely on fraud proofs that uh, the miners uh, willingly or being cursed will just prevent the fraud proofs from being mined on Ethereum for a relatively short time of one or two weeks. And then the attacker would be able to seize all the funds from the optimistic crawl-up. This has been a controversial topic. Like, uh, obviously, uh, I am a ZK roll-up maximalist, and you can say I'm biased because of that. And and we we had some clashes with people from uh, optimistic roll-up proponents, and they would argue that the community can always step in and intervene and punish the validators who do such a thing and rely eventually on social consensus for restoring, uh, for, for the ultimate censorship resistance. Uh, but I disagree that, that you can, like, you should not be building protocols that rely on such weak assumptions. This also might be valid for, uh, for the time when, once we transition to proof of stake and that, like, maybe there will be some, like, clearly written rules how the community should behave and we get some signaling from everyone in the community that they're actually going to follow these rules. And we have clear mechanisms how such a situation can be cleared up without incurring a lot of mass. Because like, imagine if that happens and um, we have a lot of DeFi transactions going on that are all intertwined. You know, like you, you put something into Uniswap and then other people put stuff in and the price moves and, and some other oracles rely on this price and so on and so on. Like it's going to be very, very difficult to sort it out after the fact. So you actually need these mechanisms to prevent censorship in, in place before. Uh, but that, that would only work once we have proof of stake. With proof of work, there is no mitigation. Like if, if the proof of work miners decide to attack an optimistic roll-up, they can do it. This is very real. And they can, they can uh, collude, they can be bribed. We, th- there m- might be some automated bribery mechanisms through uh, some smart contracts that distribute the rewards from this attack. And actually, the closer we come to the moment of transition from proof of work to proof of stake, the less proof of work miners have at stake, the less they have to lose. So, like in the last days before transition, it's very, very likely that this attack can happen. Yeah, so that's why in the long term, we want to rely on something more um, fundamental for preventing censorship, such as, for example, time locked encryption, where the users will be able to put. Uh, their transactions uh, in, in some encrypted envelopes and submit them to validators to include in the block before the validators can learn what's inside. Cool. Yeah, that makes total sense. So maybe let's do a walkthrough of how it works step by step, because so far it's been pretty abstract. So let's say I have I have an address with one Ether on layer one. How do I get it onto the ZK Sync layer two? Uh, as with any layer two, you will have to make a transaction on layer one to move these funds from layer one to layer two. Alternatively, you could just get the, the, this ETH from someone who already has it in, in layer two. So for example, if uh, you're a normal user and you just want to move your fiat to layer two, you will probably just go to an exchange and uh, withdraw directly to, to ZK Sync from there. We're currently working on down applications. The address that I have on layer two is exactly the the same that I can also have on layer one. So th- there's no confusion possible. Is that right? In, in ZK Sync, this is how we designed it. So it was very important to us to keep the very, very high degree of usability. And yes, you, you have the same address in layer two. That sounds super nice because, uh, I mean, as someone who builds decentralized projects uh, and products. I mean, we have all seen um, how often it happens that people send funds to the same address on a different network, be it a test network or layer two. Or... Absolutely. So that's super nice. Um, were there, de- were there um, technological um, challenges inherent to this? I want to also say that indeed many people do this. Many people would do transfers instead of withdrawals or deposits. They just send funds to, to, to the same, uh, like to this address and think, for example, we have a lot of users who would send funds inside ZK Sync to some address and expect it to appear on layer one without knowing that they actually have to do withdrawal. And sometimes they would send it to some address which cannot register in ZK Sync because it's a smart contract or it's just some exchange address. 
uh, and they, the, the funds w- would get stuck there. So we had to develop a special mechanism to force the funds out for new addresses that have not been used yet, which uh, w- where the owner cannot control it in, in layer two. So we have a special mechanism just like withdraw automatically and it's fully trustless. It's enforced by the protocol, it's, it's a part of the snark, so it, it can always be done. So you, you, like, you, you never are in a risk of losing any funds like no matter what you do, you know, like w- w- unless you send it to address zero, like a- any any normal mistakes are tolerated. Cool. That that's uh, super nice on the usability side. Um, so now I have say slightly less than an ether on layer two. How much how much uh, would it cost me in gas to actually transfer one ether from layer one to layer two? Um, it would cost you slightly more than a normal ether transfer. Okay, that's that's not so bad. And then um, I I now have say slightly less than an ether on layer two. Um, how how do I send it to someone else? Do I need a special wallet, or can I do it from MetaMask, or how do I go about it? Currently, you need a special wallet. What you can use is our web based wallet, which you 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 can control with MetaMask or any wallet connect enable wallet. Uh, which will derive a, a signing key for ZK Sync and store it in your browser memory. And then you can use it to, to send transactions. Uh, although you will always have to co-sign this transaction by, by MetaMask as well. So we have a kind of two-factor protection. We require the MetaMask signature, which, which is verified by our servers. This is in version one. In version two, you will be able to just sign it with MetaMask. Directly, we will support Ethereum signatures natively in zk Sync too. Is it dangerous that uh, part of the signature is uh, stored in browser? Because that sounds like uh, a bad idea. Well, that that, that uh, of course it's it's not a, uh, it's not ideal. Uh, that would be the case if you use our web based wallet. If you use any wallet that natively supports zk Sync, such as uh, Argent or Huobi Wallet or uh, I am Token. Uh, then of course you don't have this the, the the situation. You can just pick you you will use it the inside the wallet and the private key will never leave the wallet. So when you're looking for a flight, you go to a flight aggregator to see all the different places where you can buy the flight to get all the options and make sure you get the best price for your travel plans. And when you're making a DeFi swap, just do the same and use Paraswap. It beats the market prices across all the major DEXs because it aggregates them. And thanks to their network of professional market makers, you get zero slippage on your trades. So they just pushed a huge update that's even faster, more liquid, thanks to a brand new algorithm. Paraswap is now multi-chain and has expanded to Polygon and Binance Smart Chain. So go and check it out. Give Paraswap a try at paraswap.io slash epicenter. We talked about moving ETH into ZK Sync. Uh, can you move tokens natively into ZK Sync, or do you have to first move ETH and then somehow like convert them there, or how does that work? No, you can natively deposit ERC20 tokens, and uh, we also natively support Meta transactions in inside ZK Sync. So you don't need ETH or anything or like ZK Sync token uh, to to send transactions. You can deposit Dai and then pay your fees in Dai. So the wallets that support ZK Sync, they natively send the transactions to the sequencer then? This is correct. The sequencer, this is currently one centralized party, which I assume is somehow affiliated with you guys, but will be sequentially decentralized. Yes, this is correct. Is the sequencer the operator in a sense, or is there a separate operator? You, you can call it the operator. So it's, it's, it's a block producer. It's someone who collects the transactions and just puts them in the block. Okay, but there's there are also validators, right? The validators uh, are the general term for when you have a consensus uh, driven by proof of stake. This is what we, we plan to have. So then, then they will be called validators. Oh, okay, so basically currently the sequencer replaces the validators and uh, who will then be the, the block producers. Well, the, the validators will act as a collective sequencer, I, I would put it this way. 
how how do I withdraw funds to layer one, and what's what's the timescale for this? Because this is one of the the Achilles heels of of optimism, right? So basically, there because you have to you have the entire thing around pro fraud proofs and so on. Um, you actually have super long withdrawal periods. This is true. To withdraw from optimistic rollups, you natively need one week, which can be mitigated if you have liquidity providers uh, who who will borrow you some funds on layer one. But this is going to be expensive. With ZK rollups and ZK Sync specifically, what you do is you submit a transaction to the sequencer, asking them to withdraw the funds for you uh, on their one. And they will include in the block, and the moment the block is completed and, and verified on Ethereum, you will automatically get the funds on Ethereum to the address which you wished. So this is one way, this is the normal way. In this scenario, your transaction could be censored, And then you can also go and you have a second option, which is the priority queue I mentioned before, where you make a transaction on layer one and you put a record on the queue, which must be processed by the sequencer in, within some, some time frame, let's say within one day or something. And uh, if they fail to do this, then the system will enter emergency exit mode where you will be able to just prove ownership of your funds and withdraw them directly on their one. This has never happened before. I doubt this will ever happen uh, because the, the, the validators or the, the operator never has an incentive to, to send the users since they, they know this threat is, is, is valid and they will just like lose credibility. But in normal circumstances, you only have to wait for the block to, to get filled and for the proof to be generated for this block and, and submitted to Ethereum, which with ZK Sync 1 takes approximately four, four hours right now. Like it, it, it depends on the, through, on, on the actual usage of the system. Like the more blocks we have, the faster they, they get generated. And you also have an option of fast exit. If you need some funds immediately, you can opt in into paying the Uh, the block verification overhead yourself, and then the block will be immediately closed and immediately submitted for verification. And yeah, you, you also have to wait for the proof to be generated, for the snark to be generated, which uh, which is not long. It, it only takes something like 20 minutes right now, and it will be even lower with version two, because we are building it in in um, in a very parallel way, recursively. So it will go down to a few minutes. So that means that blocks are the standard thing for a block is to be full, right? But then the, the block time can vary. Is that correct? Yeah, so we expect the blocks to be full. So if you have, let's say, 1,000 transactions per uh, in, in, in 10 minutes, then the, like, and the block size is, is 1,000, then your block completeness time will be 10 minutes. I mean, so basically, then the sequencer submits this to to layer one. And how do you then deal with reorgs? Because this is also often a problem with layer twos, right? So basically, if layer one reorgs, how do you make sure that and people have already cashed out based on? I mean, how, how does this work? There is absolutely no problem with reorgs fundamentally, because if a reorg happens, then the cash outs will be reverted first. So they will, will just be erased and never happen. So what we, how we combat reorgs is we require a, um, I think 10 blocks, uh, confirm, 10 confirmations after the deposit to, to appear in ZK Sync. So when, whenever you do a deposit, we wait for 10 blocks before you see this, this amount on your uh, balance. Be before, like be before the, the, the operator will actually process it and include it in the next block. So this way we can prevent the casual reorgs, which happen on Ethereum with one or two blocks back uh, because of fluctuations of uncles. Uh, and this is only to, to prevent uh, negative user experience because if, if the reorg happened on a deposit, then we would have to roll back all the transactions that depend on this deposit and it can be a lot because they, you, you send it to some people and then they send it to further people and, and it spreads. But if a big reorg happens, which would go back more than 10 blocks, uh, then we will just roll back the database to the point where the reorg uh, correspond, where, where the, the root hash of the database would correspond 
to the previous root hash recorded on the smart contract uh, to the point of York. And we would also try to reapply the transactions that were c- collected. So if rework was non-essential, if it didn't actually modify a lot of balances and, and did not affect deposits, uh, then we will be able to reconstruct all the transactions in layer two natively. And the users will not notice anything. If it affected deposits, then some of these transactions will fail because there is not enough funds. And then they, they will cause other transactions to fail potentially because users would send funds further. But as I said, uh, it does not affect the ZK rollup in any way from the security perspective. We're, we're, we're just bound to Ethereum for finality. You mentioned a while ago that um, it's possible for for someone to close the block by paying the entire like the fee basically like it, does that introduce any denial of service attacks where one could just continuously just be like paying to close blocks before anybody can get transactions in is that something that is possible no 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 it, it, it's more so for, for you to understand the cost structure of a zk rollup every transaction must include some fee to pay for the on-chain part of this transaction plus additionally an amortized cost of a proof so you can you could theoretically include a proof for every block, even if the blocks are small, even if, if blocks contain just one transaction. But that would be super expensive. That, that would be a, an anti-scaling solution because you would pay a lot more for a single transaction than, than you would do on layer one. So the more transactions you include in the block, the 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 more the, the higher the denominator by which the proof cost is uh, divided. It's kind of like like going from flying commercial to flying private and saying, I just can't wait the three hours for the next commercial plane to go from Berlin to, say, Moscow, and uh, I'll, I'll charter a private plane. Uh, but but, but the, in this analogy, it would be a, a rather like you, you, you wait, so you have one passenger, two passengers, ten passengers uh, in this one big Boeing, which has a fixed cost of flying from, from one place to another. And, and at some point you say like, okay, I don't want to wait for anyone else. Let's fly now. I'm going to pay like the, all, all the basic costs. And you just close the gate and you fly immediately without waiting for other people. And they will just catch the next, next flight because the next flight will be immediately available after the first one departs. That's sort of the scenario in which I was thinking is like, couldn't someone who wanted to, to censor uh, the network or to do a denial of service attack, just buy, like, every time there's a new block, just, like, buy up the entire block. You know, if they had, if they have like, unlimited money. Uh, no, because all the transactions that collected by the time uh, he, he, he does this will be just included in, in, in this block. So this person will be just subsidizing everyone at, at low, low latency. So just to summarize this, um, so when I do a transaction on ZK Sync, I pay a small fee that is associated with the overhead of my transaction being um, included and a part of the overhead cost of the ZK sync proof of the verification. Uh, of the verification cost of the proof. That, this is correct, yes. So the verification cost for SNARKs for Plonk proof system, which we use, is currently around half a million gas on Ethereum. But that means because you're still dependent on the gas price on layer one, the fees on layer two will actually fluctuate with the fees on layer one, right? This is correct, yes. Okay, so you currently, do you currently have a token or do you still plan on introducing one? Uh, we don't have a token now, but we will require a token for multiple reasons. One is decentralization of the sequencer to have multiple validators who decide on what's going in, in the blocks. Uh, and the other very important reason is introduction of ZK Porter, a uh, off-chain scaling solution which will augment ZK Rollup. It will serve as, a, as, a, as an extension of ZK Rollup. Tell us about ZK Porter. So ZK Porter is, uh, is, a, uh, is an interesting idea where uh, in ZK Sync 2.0, you will have two types of accounts. ZK Rollup type of account, which will act and cost the same as, as uh, what you expect from ZK Rollup. So you will have the ultimate security from Ethereum, uh, and you will have to pay a, like, you, you will get a linear scalability boost. So you will always pay 
around one hundredth of the layer one costs. Uh, but then you will have an optional ZK Porter account type, which you can choose as a user. And if you transact within ZK Porter, with you, you only interact with other ZK Porter accounts, you will pay a very small uh, fees uh, that are independent from the gas price on Ethereum because the data will not be published through the Ethereum network. The, the states of those accounts will be only published to the so-called uh, ZK Porter guardians who will keep the, the data for you and, and uh, they will confirm each block with the majority or super majority of uh, their weighted stake um, to guarantee that this data is available. Sorry, what's a ZK Porter? ZK Porter is this new architecture I'm describing, uh, which is, so we, we, it, it's, it's an alternative account type in ZK Sync 2. You have ZK Rollup accounts and ZK Porter accounts, and you can freely choose as a user between the two. And if you, if you opt for ZK Porter, you will have very, very low fees uh, and also decreased security. You will not get the same security as with ZK Rollup. That's why we recommend, we, we encourage all the users uh, to keep most of their funds, most of their fortune in the ZK Rollup accounts. But for some, some smaller spendings, for microtransactions, for trying out things, maybe for high, like, frequent, high frequency trading, uh, you can use ZK Porter accounts. And as long as the total value locked in ZK Porter accounts is lower than the stake of ZK Porter, it's actually economically secure. It doesn't make sense for the validator to try to attack the system. So is it kind of like a POA layer three on layer two? It's more like a side chain. So it, it's an extension uh, of uh, ZK Rollup into a side chain with a very interesting property. From the side chain, you can seamlessly interoperate with any account in the ZK Rollup. So you can have a single transaction that spans across multiple accounts involving uh, both ZK Rollup and ZK Porter accounts. So for example, what this means is you can have a lot of users who are who cannot afford to be on ZK Rollup because ZK Rollup eventually Ethereum gas prices will go up a lot because we'll have a lot more users, hundred times, thousand times more users. Uh, it's, it's inevitable that they will will go up even if we, we all use layer two solutions. Uh, so some users will will just not be able to participate. It's, it's just going to be too expensive for them. So they can stay on ZK Porter side pay very low fees, but still interact with Uniswap, Compound, Balancer, Curve, all the protocols, DeFi protocols on the ZK rollup side, where all the whales are and, and all the, uh, the, the other users, everyone, uh, but they will still pay very small fees for that. It's crazy that we're already anticipating a, a time and a world in which Layer two solutions are also too expensive to use, and so we need to move to, you know, uh, uh, other layers. This is what we observe with Ethereum. The uh, number of users over the past year rose approximately twelve x, thirteen x, but the uh, the gas prices uh, rose uh, square of that. So we can only it's only nature to anticipate that the same thing will sooner rather than later happen to layer two, because. The, the, this is called induced demand. Once you have a lot more opportunities to trade uh, and you and do NFTs and do a lot of interesting things in layer two, more people will do it a lot more frequently. And this will drive the prices up again. So Alex, you kind of already alluded to this, but this also means that uh, ZK Sync is also smart contract compatible, right? Yes, a CK Sync 2 will have not just smart contracts, but full EVM compatibility or like EVM portability. You will be able to take existing smart contracts that are live on layer one and easily port them to ZK Sync and just deploy out of box. Most of them will just work. So that means I mean, you, you redeploy essentially a smart contract that was deployed to Ethereum. Uh, does that does that imply any ability for users of say like an ERC twenty token that was deployed on one of these contracts to interoperate with? You? Can can you move assets from one contract to to the other? Are they what what are the kind of interesting dynamics that might exist between like those two layers? Uh, absolutely, sure. So you you, you will have so our design of zk EVM was to keep all the properties from Ethereum, 
including composability. If you deploy multiple contracts, they will be able to interact with each other just the same way it's currently possible on Ethereum in atomic transactions that can uh, can all execute or, or can revert partially. Like everything that will, will just look and feel exactly the same as an Ethereum layer one. Okay, so so you could have essentially like a transaction where, you know, for example, like you were kind of building a complex transaction where you like mint die uh, on a CDP and then you take that die and like, I don't know, trade it on Uniswap or something like, you know, you, you do some other action. Uh, you, you could do some sort of like cross layer transactions where you mint die on the CDP and then that die gets sent uh, immediately into say like a, uh, an AMM or a DEX on, um, on ZK Rollup. Is that is that possible or is there like some extra complexity there? You mean like moving funds between layer one and layer two? Yeah, like in a sing, in sort of like a single in a single transaction. So the you can never have layer one, layer two interaction in a single transaction. It's always asynchronous because the blocks are only committed to Ethereum uh, once in a while. Uh, and a- anything can happen in, in between in those blocks. So you will have an asynchronous calls between layer one and layer two both ways. You can use, you can send uh, some message with some funds from layer one to layer two, and it will eventually uh, appear there and, and will interact with the contract. And you can do it the other way around. Or you can have atomic transactions within layer two that, that, that happen inside one single transaction. Uh, but you, you can you can extend that to layer one to layer two. Okay, so you can have atomic transactions just as you do on on layer one, but there's no atomic transactions like between layer one and layer two. Correct. Yes. So, what are the applications that you would say zk sync is particularly well suited to, or do you think it's equally well suited to all applications? I I personally think that most applications within a year will be on zk rollup. Most of Ethereum will migrate to ZK Rollup. I, I, I can't imagine any alternative. Like I, I just don't see a plausible alternative to that because ZK Rollup offers uh, superior properties to any other scaling solution. So I, I'm, I don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about other scaling solutions launching now. It's really important that Ethereum can scale today. Uh, even, even if we have to take some, some uh, trade-offs in, into account, but mid to long term, ZK rollups are just better in every possible regard. I don't see any other any reason not to be on the ZK rollup. So they are cheaper, even if you just compare the the ZK the, the rollup transactions. They are cheaper than let's say optimistic rollups because you, you you need to put less data on chain and you also can have some super linear scaling if multiple account if the same accounts do multiple transactions in the same block. Which is, for example, the case if you if you do a lot of frequent Oracle updates, because the Oracle updates only modify a single variable on the contract. Right, so you can do it like multiple times, and then at the end you will only have one single update of the state. Whereas an optimistic rollup, you would have to post every single Oracle update separately. Um, so they're cheaper on the rollup side. Uh, they have the option of this uh, super cheap sidechain like zk porter still with much improved security compared to side chains because the the uh, validators the guardians of uh, zk porter can never corrupt the state the only thing that can go wrong with the zk porter is that the state is frozen which is unlikely because then how are you going to exploit this like can you, you, would, you would have to blackmail the users somehow it, it's complicated it's a lot more complicated than in the side chain where you can just grab uh, all, all the assets and, and move them to a different address and you have really nice properties with user experience because the finality is fast. You can withdraw funds instantly from, from the rollup. You can withdraw NFTs instantly. You don't, for NFTs, there is no mitigation. For, for any fraud proof based system, you will have to wait exactly one week for your NFT to, to go from layer two to layer one. Uh, but even for fungible uh, tokens, um, if you want to move some small amount of funds, then the interchain solutions, some state payment channels will help you. But if you want to move half of the, of the value locked in some protocol, that's probably going to be problematic. It, it won't work as easily. Uh, so all of these problems are solved with ZK rollups. So as soon as we can support full EVM compatibility and, it, and it's, it's been proven and everyone sees that it works on layer one, 
we expect most protocols to just go to, to ZK rollup. So what's the blocker with um, the EVM compatibility? Because that's not live on mainnet yet, right? That's still on testnet? So that's, that, that's currently build, being built. So we, we just released our first testnet with ZKVM. And there is no blocker anymore. I can, I can explain what was the blocker, why it was only possible to build this here, why it was not, uh, not considered before. I gave a couple of talks on this. So essentially, um, the first generation of ZK rollups were application specific. They could only do some very limited fixed functionality. For example, transfers or, or AMM or a DEX, but it, it was limited to, to one function which could be repeated multiple times. With smart contracts, the challenge was that the users want to define smart contracts themselves. Uh, and each smart contract can be different in terms of code and in terms of the execution length of this code. So execution trace can vary. Depending on the data you, you, you provide as an input and depending on the function you call and what, on what contract you call it. And this was very hard to wrap in zero knowledge proofs. Like the zero knowledge proofs require the programs for which we can construct snarks and like prove some computational statements to be con representable as arithmetic circuits. You can think of it as a as a, uh, as a like as a physical circuit, you have some inputs, and then it goes goes through some gates in like one one way flow without uh, w without back loops, and then at the end you get some results. So the other way to think about it is a is a just a function, a mathematical function, f from x is equal to a plus b times c blah blah blah. You know, like some some very complex expression. But it's a single expression. There is no way to encode loops in this expression. There is no way to encode conditionals, except for just like build two branches of this conditional statement separately and then combine them uh, conditionally. Like if we wanted to go to the left branch, then take this result. If we wanted to go to the, to the right branch, take this result. But th that, that, that's some fixed structure which you cannot program. So how you add programmability? Um, so th that, that was a big challenge. There were multiple approaches that, that uh, allowed that. One was called TinyRAM, where you build a snark which does not prove any particular program, but can prove any program uh, by executing the opcodes of this program at every execution step. It's a bit hard to explain in, on a podcast without the, the visuals, with, without going like making some pictures. But you can imagine uh, just like a mathematical function that executes every possible opcode at every possible step. Just one big matrix, n times m, where one side is the number of opcodes which you have in your uh, virtual machine, and the other dimension is the number of steps which you have to go to up to the very the maximum. If you do it naively, that would be very expensive. That would give you a 1000x overhead over what, what is possible to prove in, in SNARKs. And SNARKs are already not cheap. You know, like we, in, in, in our estimates, the transactions uh, on ZK Sync 2.0 will cost something around one cent per transaction for most DeFi protocols. So one cent is okay, but if you, if you did like thousand X, it would be hundred dollars for a transaction, which would be a no-go. So we needed some way to optimize that and it came with recursion. So it, it, I, I won't be able to explain it now why, like what, 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 how recursion gives us the ability to combine multiple contracts together. But I would just say that recursion is one of the necessary components and we just did not have ef efficient recursion on Ethereum before last year. The first implementation that was live on testnet uh, of a recursive snark was done by Matter Labs uh, for the Reddit scaling challenge, which we deployed uh, last August. And it's now live on ZK Sync 1.0 since January this year. So it took time for, for the solution to get mature. And now with, with recursive uh, proofs, the rest is, is like more an engineering effort. Now we can have all opcodes that the EVM also has plus the precompiles? 
We don't have the same opcodes as EVM. What we, what we have is a separate virtual machine, which is optimized for SNARKs with a separate opcode set, which uh, we, we take these Solidity programs and we transcompile them uh, into this new virtual machine, in, in, into the opcodes for this vir new virtual machine. Would it have helped you if the BFT signatures um, had, uh, had already been shipped? It would help us if we had support, like we, we could have implemented recursion earlier, maybe two years ago, if we had support for different elliptic curves on Ethereum, uh, but not BLS, uh, not BLS 12. Uh, rather, we would need something like BNT curves, which are much larger. They, they have something like 700 bits uh, length as opposed to 256, 50, 54 that we have for, for, for BLS and BN256 curves, which we currently use on Ethereum. Uh, but, uh, and we actually implemented a precompile for that. It, it just never got accepted. Oh, okay. So w one question that I've, I've, I've wanted to ask for a while now. So we've talked about scalability for a long time now, but basically, as you said in the very beginning, Zero knowledge is obviously lends itself really well to privacy as well. And this is how, how almost everyone um, initially approached this in 2017 when it kind of entered the scene. So do you plan on using this for privacy as well? Because it seems like something that you, you would probably be able to get quite cheaply, no? Uh, absolutely. So you can actually get privacy out of box with, with this kind of type of solution with, with ZK rollups. Because for the transactions uh, that contain some snarks for privacy, you don't have to publish the proofs on chain. It's sufficient to have them as a witness or as input of the transaction, which you just omit in the final block. But you verify them in, as a part of, of, of your block proof. Uh, so that means that you will be able to implement something like Zcash protocol on top of ZK Sync. And the transactions, uh, the shielded transactions in this protocol will cost almost the same as normal transfers, just slightly more expensive. That's really cool. So we, we don't intend to do it uh, in Matter Labs, but we, we, because we want to remain a neutral platform where everyone can build stuff and we don't want to intervene and build our own applications. Uh, but we, we talked to a couple of projects who, are, who have interest and in, who are intending to build uh, privacy solutions on top of ZK Sync. You just talked about Matter Labs, uh, just kind of circling back to that. Uh, what's, the, what's the business model here with ZK Sync? How do you uh, intend to make money as a company with this? Uh, so as a company, we will, there are multiple ways to approach this from the company perspective. So there will be token involved and there, there might be some ways to monetize the token. Uh, there might be some services we will be building. Uh, but in general, ZK Sync is going to be a decentralized protocol, uh, which is owned by the community, not by any given company. And uh, the, the, there will be, of course, a token which, which can be used for uh, staking to become a validator and to become ZK Sync Guardian. We were talking about the token uh, earlier. When, when would the token be launched? Uh, we will have to launch it before ZK or together with ZK Sync 2.0 because we will need it for the ZK Porter. So just kind of zoom, zooming out a little bit, I mean, we did talk about this during the show uh, to some extent, and you, know, you were pretty uh, uh, you know, confident that uh, most of the usage of Ethereum would, would move to, um, to ZK Sync. It, that seems like a, an, an incredibly huge feat, you know, to move like all of the Ethereum applications and like all of the liquidity and like all of the usage basically from, you know, the main net to a layer two. And, you know, I'm sure that's like it's desirable, right? To have that extra transaction throughput, and we're going to need it. And like I think like zk sync is one of many solutions that can offer that. But what what's necessary for that to happen? Because it seems like a very chicken and egg type problem. I mean, if we have congestion on the Ethereum network today, it's because most of the apps are being built there. That's because most people are using it. What is the uh, the sort of black swan event that happens that makes it such that you know this uh, flow of usage and and tokens uh, start moving into um, layer twos and specifically like into ZK Sync. Um, so uh, I, I just want to correct and say that I believe that the most applications will be on ZK rollups. So maybe not necessarily on ZK Sync, but I believe that the, the the very large part will be on ZK Sync because we're currently the only ZK rollup with EVM compatibility. And from from what we learned from the market is. Uh, 
a lot of projects strongly prefer to have the same code base across layer one and layer two, and this is why they, they will, I, I believe they, they will most likely launch on ZK Sync rather than other ZK rollups. But there might be um, uh, other projects who do not care about that and can, can, impl- can work with different languages, and maybe they will prefer other ZK rollups, but it will be all ZK rollups. That, that's for sure. That there is no doubt about that. Long term, it's, it's only ZK rollups. And why everyone will move from layer one, uh, it, it's very simple. If the gas prices will just go up back to where they were at the worst stance, and Ether price will likely to go uh, up, um, so w- w- the transaction costs will be just enormous. It, it, like, it will just naturally push all the users from layer one to layer two. Even the whales, eventually, what it will take is first and foremost, the lindiness of layer two solutions. So they must remain operational for a pretty long time for everyone to get confidence. It's never enough to just publish something and say, oh, we audited it and, uh, and now you're, uh, you, you should just use the, the, the solution. It's, it's totally safe. It's never the case. It always has to stand the test of time. And uh, the, the things might happen. There might be bugs. There might be some, some problematic situations. We're planning for that. Uh, we are actually just announced a, an introduction of ZK Sync Security Council and a multi-factor approach to security. And uh, we, uh, like, it works uh, roughly as we will have the validators who first validate their transactions naively. And only if they, they believe the transaction is valid, then they will generate the zero-knowledge proofs for it so that not everyone can generate zero knowledge proofs and, and, and immediately submit them to Ethereum. And if something goes wrong, we, we, we will have some people who are trusted by the community to intervene and re- shorten the upgrade, uh, upgrade time for, uh, for introducing some fixes. Because currently the ZK Sync, um, upgraded, ZK Sync is an upgradable protocol, but we have a long notice period. Any change has to be announced in advance for the community and only after a couple of weeks passed and everyone who didn't like it had a chance to opt out uh, is the change enacted. But like coming back to, to the question, um, we believe that there must be some time for these protocols to mature and get trust. Once this happens, we will see a gradual migration. It will be not like overnight, but more and more liquidity and more and more users will move from layer one to layer two until eventually it flippens uh, uh, layer one itself and like most activity happens on layer two. Cool. Where can people go to find out more about uh, Matter Labs and ZK Sync and all of the great research uh, that you guys are doing? ZKSync.io uh, has a pretty comprehensive documentation, but for the end users, uh, we have some FAQ which are very structured and for the developers, uh, with, with code snippets, with, with getting started guides, uh, developer documentation, everything. Great. Alex, thanks for joining us today. It's been a pleasure, Alex. Thank you, guys, and thank, thanks to all the listeners. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, the guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.